The uh, Honourable Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be in the House today, and I'm pleased to rise uh, today to speak to the mission against ISIS and the contribution that Canada is making to the important international coalition fighting ISIS. However, before discussing the, the details of this uh, new mission, I'd like to take a moment uh, and ask all of us to recognize the brave men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces uh, who uh, unselfishly uh, put themselves out there and are willing, uh, willingly f uh, out there to fight and protect Canadian values around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, there's certainly no greater service to our country, uh, and I thank each and every individual who has fought overseas to protect us here at home. Now, Mr. Speaker, today I'd like to talk about Canadian values. Now, the Prime Minister and his colleagues seem content on using this term to justify this mission. But, Mr. Speaker, their actions on the ISIL mission certainly do not back up those hollow words. To me, the way to tell what someone's values are is not by just what they say, but what they actually do. And that age-old adage goes, Mr. Speaker, that actions speak louder than words. And when it comes to the mission against ISIS, our international partners are hearing very loud and clear that uh, Canada is content on leaving the heavy lifting to everyone else. And that's just not what Canadians do. So let's look uh, at what our international partners are gearing up for while our jets are coming home. France has expanded its airstrikes. The United States has expanded its airstrikes. And the British Parliament just recently approved a motion to expand airstrikes. So while our partners get ready to take the fight to ISIS, Canadian fighters are back, packing up to come home. For myself, and I think I speak for many Canadians, Canadian values have never been to turn your back when the going gets tough. Canadian values have never been to leave your friends in the dust, and they most certainly have never been to run from a fight to protect those who need our help. So let's look at some past conflicts and what the precedent has been for Canadian responses when called upon to act. World War I was a true testament to Canadian character and forged our identity in the global community. Nobody can dispute that. As a relatively new nation and a nation that was largely viewed to be under British rule, many players on the world stage did not know what to expect from Canada. Canadian soldiers showed true strength during this conflict and were a crucial part of numerous missions. I can think of no greater testament to Canadian strength than the Battle of Vimy Ridge. In this battle, Canadians were handed the task of attacking German forces and capturing the ridge that they occupied. In the end, Canadian soldiers did what over 200,000 British and French soldiers could not. They captured Vimy Ridge. The victory at Vimy Ridge in 1917 was the single largest advance against German forces since the beginning of the war and paved the way for the end of the conflict. This victory did not come without a cost, though, as more than 10,000 Canadians were killed and wounded during the mission. When called on to act, Canada did not cut and run. During the Second World War, Canadians fought bravely at uh, a lot of places, uh, but among them Juneau Beach, and again showed true strength and determination in service to their country. At Juneau Beach, Canadians stormed the beach during Operation Overlord and ultimately seized control. Approximately 574 Canadians were wounded and about 340 made the ultimate sacrifice during this operation. However, the successful Canadian mission at Juneau Beach would provide a crucial access point and bridgehead which ultimately led to the liberation of Europe. And, on a, uh, and once again, Canada did not cut and run. And, uh, you know, all of us, uh, most of us have a, have a story that goes back to the Second World War or, or other conflicts. And I have a great uncle buried, uh, buried in Holland in Grosbeek Cemetery. And uh, that was his uh, uh, sacrifice that uh, he ultimately gave to, uh, to help free uh, Holland. And um, anyway, there's a lot of uh, brave moments like that, and, and it just shows the example of what many soldiers uh, uh, did. Uh, they didn't cut and run. And then, Mr. Speaker, there was the Korean War. Between 1950 and 1953, 
About 26,000 Canadian soldiers came to the aid of South Korea during the Korean War. 516 Canadians made the ultimate sacrifice in this effort. By looking at the contrast today between North and South Korea, it is clear that this was a battle worth fighting. Once again, Canada did not cut and run. The reason I present each of these historical conflicts, Mr. Speaker, is to demonstrate that Canadians have never valued running from a fight that was worth fighting. When democracy, freedom, tolerance, and the rule of law are under threat, it has been the Canadian response to respond in a meaningful way. This is no different today. An Angus Reid poll from February 6th found that 63% of Canadians say that they would like to see Canadian Canada continue bombing ISIS at its current rate or to go even further. Furthermore, only 18% think that pulling our jets from the fight will have a positive effect on international uh, or on our international reputation. 18% want to cut and run. That means 82% don't. Prime Minister David Cameron said it best recently when he stated, we should not be content to outsource our security to our allies. If we believe action can help protect us, then with our allies, we should be part of that action, not standing aside from it. Here, here. The same logic should stand for Canada. If we truly believe that action is required to defeat ISIS, then let's take action. Let's not base decisions on campaign rhetoric. Let's base them on the true needs of our international partners. With that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to close here shortly, but uh, uh, I want to thank um, many members in this House for standing up uh, and uh, trying to get the point out there of what Canada should be doing in our, uh, as our responsibility and obligations uh, around the world. The member from Selkirk Interlake, uh, uh, the member from uh, Muskoka, and many others on this side of the House have uh, argued very uh, clearly uh, why Canada should not cut and run. It's not what we do, uh, and it's not what we should do. So with that, I'm uh, happy to take questions, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments. The uh, Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his uh, speech. He, he gave us uh, examples of where other coalition partners have increased uh, their airstrike capacity. I'd be curious if he has any information about other coalition partners increasing their humanitarian aid, their intelligence uh, gathering capacities, or their international development work on the ground. For Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Well, thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, through you uh, to my colleague uh, uh, for the question. What we're debating here today is uh, the mission as a whole and, and our responsibility out there. And uh, we all know that uh, the mission um, contained many aspects of humanitarian aid, and we should. Uh, but at the same time, along with uh, uh, the CF-18 fighters that had a key role in there, uh, what have you, once you take away a main component of it, and the fighter pilots are, um, our planes are a key part of this thing. You, you can't uh, um, you know, go in and take out a key part and expect the mission to go uh, as planned and uh, what have you. And I think that uh, if, the, if the member across there really thinks about it and admits it to himself, um, we are putting uh, some soldiers in, uh, in danger and there's, uh, it's certainly not necessary to do that. Questions and, questions and comments. Question comment. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member, L'Honorable Député. The Honourable Member for Saint Boniface Saint Vital. Sure. Uh, I heard the term "cut and run" uh, several times during the uh, the member's presentation. Is the member aware that we are increasing our our military personnel by 200 members uh, in the upcoming mission? We are tripling the size of our train, advise, and assist mission, as well as spending $145 million over the next three years to counter terrorism. We will be delivering $940 million in humanitarian assistance and $270 million over three years to rebuild the local infrastructure. 
Uh, my question to the honourable member is, does that sound like cutting and running to him? Here, here. Bruce Gray on sound. Again. To you, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for the question. And yes, I'm quite uh, aware that the numbers uh, have increased of soldiers. But really, uh, if you want to put the whole thing in perspective, by pulling those uh, CF-18s out of there, which are there to protect our, uh, our people on the ground, and there are people on the ground today before this mission uh, changed. So what you're doing is increasing the number of people put at risk. Uh, by pulling them out there. So uh, to use that, uh, uh, you know, to try and say that everything's okay, no, it isn't. Uh, it's one thing to increase the numbers, but you can't take away the, uh, everything that's required to, to help protect them there, and that's what we've done. And, you know, I know the member doesn't like the term cut and run, but that's exactly what it is. And uh, as a proud Canadian, uh, all of us in here, that's not what we do. Questions and comments? Uh,